Hello, and welcome to The Trans Agenda, a podcast by Trans Clinique. I'm your host, Nico, and I'm a trans man, and my pronouns are he and they. Every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we'll be right here talking about the trans agenda. In this podcast, we'll delve into the unique challenges and experiences of trans folks, highlighting the voices of those who have lived it themselves. We'll explore issues such as navigating medical and legal systems, finding acceptance within family and community, and combating discrimination and violence. Our guests will share their personal stories and expertise, providing valuable insights and perspectives on this often misunderstood aspect of the human experience. Join us as we strive to educate, inform, and advocate for trans rights and visibility. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Trans Agenda. Here we have Dragon King. You want to introduce yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm Dragon King. My pronouns in drag are they, them, out, they, he. Um, I do drag. <laughs> um, and I'm also a volunteer for the National LGBT Hotline and work at a few venues and yeah, if it's nightlife, I'm probably poking my head around. Yeah, I love that. So you want to tell us a little bit more about your trans identity and how you found yourself as a trans person, what what that process was like? Yeah, um, I did not come out until I was about 20, 21. Um, I, a friend of mine, I was in college marching band, you know, the place where all the queers go. Um, and I was talking about how I was feeling, how I didn't really... I was saying things like, I people aren't treating me like a woman. I feel like there's something wrong with me. My friend's like, well, have you ever heard of uh, non-binary? He's like, what the fuck is that? Um, so I, I YouTubed it and everything fell into place. Mm, mm-hmm. And then soon after I came out as pansexual. And then maybe a year after that, I started discovering what drag is. And when I first started doing drag, the main point was like, I just want to go for boy. Like I wasn't on T. I hadn't started transitioning at all. Um, and it was my way of kind of working through my gender. And now that I've been on T that I feel like much more comfy in my body, my, my drag is much more like queer masculinity, eldritch horror stuff. Um, really just pushing the boundaries on what is humanity going into like sometimes political drag, sometimes, um horror drag when i do terror vaults just all the things yeah so you know we've had a couple of drag kings on the podcast which i love and um a a lot of the time they actually talk a lot about how um drag has really helped them find their identity Mm -hmm. and it sounds like that's kind of been your experience like how do you think being trans um ties into your performance as a drag performer it's My identity definitely ties in because sometimes Dragon will be like kind of doing both. Like I'll wear like a corset and I'll have like the full cleavage. Actually, sometimes people think my boobs are silicone and will like the number of times someone has like touched my chest and be like, wait, that's not silicone. It's like, no, you also did not ask. Please remove your hand. Um, So sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's very like, because I identify as trans non-binary now. So sometimes it'll be like, That'll affect how I dress. Sometimes it'll be very femme. Sometimes I'll wear the silicone chest plate, the the fun instant abs. <laughs> um, and, you know, sometimes I have like a very specific number that has a very specific look, but sometimes I will change how I'm dressing based on how I'm feeling that day. Mm-hmm. So it'll, um, it definitely affects how I dress. And I I'm just really, really not feeling presenting as one one gender or the other that's when i do like the more creaturey drag where it's like you don't know what my gender is and you will not know um when i did the one of the years i did terra vault i was a spider demon and like i had a full spider mask going on full cape you could not tell who the fuck i was and the this woman came up to me was like is that a boy or a girl (laughs) i'm an arachnid (laughs) So that's the energy I try to bring a lot. You just described like my childhood. Yeah. Like, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I'm an arachnid and my gender yeah. is legs. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. People, I you know, every day in elementary school, people would be asking me, are you a boy or a girl? And I'm like, I, I eventually I got pissed off, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? I'm neither. I'm just weird. You know? And so <laughs> I would like go to 
school with like an underwear on my head or like <laughs> bottles in my hair because that was like the Lady Gaga like you know or you oh the, yeah in the telephone music video like yeah. I was just fucking with people at that point because <laughs> I was pissed off you know yeah. so that's you like unlock that <laughs> I was like oh my god that's god. cool yeah so tell us a little bit more about like your drag career we mm-hmm. talk a lot on this podcast about business mm-hmm. um, and trans people making money and trans people in business and being a performer is definitely a hustle. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a trans performer, like how has that been for you? It's because I do so many different types of drag, be it um, political, some sometimes just very boy king drag, sometimes creature. It's sometimes difficult to know what shows to put me in. So mm. the way I help supplement my income is um, I work at co check at the great northern as well as at monarch um they've and actually they've started letting me like produce stuff there like i Mm -hmm. i am the co-producer of art battle now um i'm in the process of starting i'm in the process of starting a brand new um trans dance party at monarch with bonita rose who knew and jordan and it's going to be a trans non-binary dance party um, for trans non-binary people and all those who love them. Um, so I do make a lot of my money, my supplementary income from working in nightlife. Um, I sometimes also work at Oasis. So finding that balance of like, yes, I want to do drag. Yes, I want that to be a source of income. But as a disabled performer who sometimes can't say yes to as many gigs, as everyone because just sometimes my health will not allow it um sometimes i choose like okay for this week i'm gonna work nightlife this week i'll take on some gigs and it's a very like sometimes um delicate balancing act of how much work do i do to pay my rent versus how much break time do i give myself so that i don't have health complications Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i deal with uh, chronic fatigue as Mm -hmm. well so it that's definitely the balance right is how much work can i really do (laughs) you know so that's uh, i mean it sounds like you work really hard to do what you do so that's amazing i i i I certainly do that yeah um it's really cool thank you and um and just because i said disabled um i'm type 1 diabetic Woo. There are actually a lot of type 1 diabetic drags now, which makes me so, so happy. Um, Who Knew is one of them. Um, there's also Lola Wren. There's um, Tina Turnblad. I love my, my diabetic siblings so much. We work, we work, we're insane. We work so fucking hard and just have to chug sugar just to stay alive sometimes. Oh my God. But we're working it. <laughs> yeah. How is it? Like, what are some of the things as a disabled trans person that you, you kind of find are roadblocks for you? In the, in the drag space. In specifically the drag space? Um, or nightlife in general, yeah. Nightlife. Um, when I start working at a new venue, I have to explain what's going on with me. Um, I just started working at Pawn Shop, which is a, a speakeasy that looks like an actual pawn shop in the front. And then it's my job to be like, welcome to the pawn shop. What have you brought me today? Um, so I have to, you know, be in character for hours and hours and hours and I have to I'm starting to tell my uh, new co-workers like hey I'm type 1 diabetic sometimes I do need to pause to like drink a soda do something because if I don't I one of the symptoms of a low blood sugar for me is um, stuttering Mm -hmm. so like it'll be stuttering it'll be shaking Um, sometimes low blood sugars are mistaken as someone being drunk in public Mm -hmm. um, and like if you if I tried to drive while having a low blood sugar and I got pulled over, it would be the same as getting a DUI. Mm. Like I would get a DUI for that. So it's very like teaching people what it is I need and explaining to them like, no, this is like this isn't me just being a brat who wants like a snack time. This is like if I do not eat this quickly, I'm going to go into a diabetic coma. Mm-hmm. So like explain to people and explain to producers sometimes like, hey, I'm having a low, like, can you move me back in the set a bit? Um, Just having to explain over and over and over again, like what this is. No, it's not type two diabetes. No, you should not tell me what I should or should not be eating or ripping food. 
ripping food out of my hand, which has happened. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> no, people are insane. People are like, "Oh, well, my my <laughs> sister's cousin's boyfriend has diabetes, and he lost a foot." And it's like, "Okay, nice to meet you." Yeah, that's what I want to talk about right now. Oh my god! Um, I know people are just audacious. You know yeah. what I mean? So having to explain to people like what type one diabetes is, why I need access to food. And why I sometimes do need to stop and, like, take care of myself. It's it's a process. But I will say the drag scene, like, I mostly work in Soma and sometimes in Oakland. And they have been very good about it. They have been very um, understanding. It's very rare that I need to pause. But they do give me that space to, like, take a second to take care of myself. And honestly, some of them have literally saved my life before. I remember once I... Um, I was having a really bad low blood sugar and I was like starting to pass out and because of uh, Ma Sugar Nuts and her partner Mikey I am still here today because mm. they gave me some sugar and they called my partner I was like no you need to get here right now like yeah. Dragon is having a moment um, like they literally saved my life and I'm very grateful to them <laughs> that's beautiful you know because yeah. I, I do feel like drag a lot of the time especially in nightlife and in San Francisco it is like a family yeah. and people take care of each other so you know, is what? When did you start doing drag? Um, I've been doing it for about three and a half years now. Before that, I did years of Rocky Horror, so that was my like, that was kind of my gateway <laughs> to drag. Um, yeah, um, I love that. <laughs> yeah. I actually I wasn't allowed to do theater when I was in high school because my dad said it would distract me from my studies. He wasn't wrong, uh, <laughs> so I became a band kid instead. And then I was like, no, I want I want the theater. So okay. I did Rocky Horror. And then after I moved out of Davis, because there's nothing drag there, there's just nothing there. After I moved and went to my first Rebel Kings of Oakland show, that was like, nope, yep, doing this. Yeah. Doing this. You found your calling. <laughs> I found it. I, I love, love it. that. <laughs> yeah, you said, um, you said you also do the Trans Lifeline? I... I do the National LGBT Hotline. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. with Vera. That's yeah. awesome. That, that's how, how did you get involved with that? Um, well, I got involved because um, Vera, my drag dad, was talking about it at a Rebel King show and was like, you know, we're taking volunteers. Um, we will train you. And they became my trainer. And that's how we got to know each other. Like, they were the one who trained me how to be um, a queer peer counselor. And about a year into it, I... <laughs> My drag cousin, Luke Modella, was like, just ask Vera to be your dad. I was like, no, he has so many children already. <laughs> this was this was back when it was only like 11. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. <laughs> now it's 28. No, 28, 28. It went It went up mm -hmm. since we had Vera on the podcast. <laughs> of course. <it> did. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, yeah. So Luke um, <laughs> brought them over after some art camp. Locked us both in the car. He's like, drag and ask. He's like, Brought out a little lollipop. I was like, Vera, will you be my dad? <laughs> and of course they said yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how, I, that's how I got involved. And I've been doing it for a while now. And uh, we are still looking for volunteers. Shit is crazy right now. We get a lot of calls all over the country. So yeah. if you can give even three hours, you can do it from home. We'll send you the headset. We'll teach you how to do it. Um, you'll have weeks and weeks of training before we, you know, throw you into it. And sometimes it's suicide calls, but sometimes it's coming out calls. Um, we need, I need resources calls because we have like a little database where if we type in your zip code, we can look up what's around you within a hundred miles. And that could be like nice. healthcare, that can be community centers, bars. I've seen book clubs pop up, which is really cute. That is really cute. <laughs> yeah. um, and sometimes it really is just people like, hey, you are the first queer person I've ever talked to in my life. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I just want to talk. I just want to talk about my day. I just want to talk with someone who will understand. And it's like, yes, of course, baby. Oh my God. Yeah. That is so sad. How do you feel like that's impacted your life as a queer person? Like talking to these people who need help? It has made me a much better active listener. Um, I'm I'm autistic. So I sometimes struggle with like, there, there's when you're autistic sometimes you feel the need to be like oh this happened to you let me tell you about my own personal experience so like Vera teaching me one of the best things Vera taught me is like 
listening to someone like go over this like really difficult things happening to them and listening for those like little things be like hey i just want to lift up that you are going like you are being very brave like lifting up the positive talking through never giving direct advice Mm -hmm. never giving direct advice you don't know what this person's going through and truly just talking through like potential options and seeing how they are feeling in their gut about the situation because if you like give them the space to talk and give some options eventually they will come to their own like what is best for them conclusions they Mm -hmm. just really need that space to like talk it out and knowing that there are so many people out there that don't come out as trans or queer until they're like in their 60s or 70s just reminds me how important the work I do is and talking to kids as young as nine like nine years old like I'm bi trans what have you like knowing that because we have this hotline because we have drag like knowing that they are getting in the information that I would have loved to have had when mm. I was their age. Like it, it just, it, it fills me with purpose and like, it, it is a tough job. Like doing the hotline is a very like spoon draining job. I only do three hours a week, mm. but um, it's, it's so worth it. Like some of the calls I've had, like I can't talk about the details obviously. Cause like it's an yeah. anonymous hotline hotline but i like i have there have been so many calls where like after i've hung up i have just full-on sobbed yeah in like a happy way in a sad way in a like like they they have really those people on the hotline have really changed my life wow yeah it's beautiful i and you said something that i think is a really important concept um which is spoons Mm. and i you know i remember when i learned what that meant and so i wonder if you could explain to our listeners What is that? Because I think it's very important, right, to be mindful of how many spoons do you have, you know? (laughs) Yeah, and and that's something I've actually um, a lot of had to explain a lot of times on the hotline, and I think it's really helped some people before. So the concept is, um, I don't know where the word spoon came from, that I don't know, but the concept is every day you wake up with five spoons, and there are certain activities that can cost spoons or replenish them. Like say, say making a phone call makes you really anxious. For some people that might be not losing any spoons. For some, excuse me. For some people that might be losing two spoons. That's like spoons are like energy points. It's like you get five energy points a day, and different activities can replenish or take them away. So if you're the kind of person who needs alone time to replenish, that might help you regain all your spoons. If you're the kind of person who gets really anxious in social situations, that might take away a bunch of spoons. And the important thing to keep in mind is how am I setting up my day in terms of spoon replenishment? Like, am I saying yes to too many spoon draining things to the point where at the end of the day, I just feel dead inside and like am sobbing. And the more, (laughs) yeah. And the more, (laughs) but like the more, the more you think about it, it's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't say yes to, if I'm anxious about taking phone calls, maybe I shouldn't say yes to making five big long phone calls today. Maybe I should do three phone calls and then an activity that helps replenish me, like say reading a book or hanging out with a friend or something like that. Like reminding yourself that, because if you hit that removal of all five spoons, and you have no way to replenish them, of course you're gonna feel burned out. Of course Mm -hmm. you're gonna feel anxious and hurt and all those things. So um, kind of being mindful of like, what am I doing in my day that's causing this distress? And is there a way to at least have a spoon replenisher in the middle of it, or maybe take out some of those things in that day and like spread them out a bit more throughout my week? Yeah. That's really helpful. I, I definitely need to take that advice. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's been so fun having you on the podcast. You, you have so me. much amazing things to share. Um, I do like to ask everybody this one question, mm-hmm. which is what is your trans agenda? Ooh. My... So when I went to college, my major was in sociology and I learned how to condense information. My trans agenda is to, because there's so much suppression of 
information right now with like book bans and all that, my trans agenda is to better distribute information and to do it in a way that creates hope because there's so much like, you know, there's so many movies that are about dystopias. There's so many movies about like, oh, we're all gonna die. I want more media that gives people hope and like, no, we can work towards a better future. Like we can, we can be our own Steven universe and like, Oh, I love that. Yeah. Like <laughs> make our, find our chosen family, create a better world and help people who through just sheer ignorance or misunderstanding, like we can, we can all go through it together. We don't all have to be the same to get along. Like we can, we can just, take a little bit of extra care, take a little bit of extra time and better distribute information. And yeah, that, that's my trait. That's my trans agenda. I love that. Even though I love zombie movies, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> trans individuals face unique challenges every day from accessing healthcare to navigating legal systems. It is crucial that we work towards creating a society that is inclusive and supportive of people of all gender identities. This means advocating for policies and practices that prioritize the health and well-being of trans individuals, as well as challenging discriminatory attitudes and behaviors where they exist. By coming together to support and uplift trans voices, we can create a brighter and more equitable future for everyone. Thank you for listening and let us continue to work towards a world where trans individuals can thrive. Follow us on all social media platforms at TransClinique and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button.